Alors, euh, bonjour tout le monde. Euh, il nous fait plaisir aujourd'hui d'accueillir euh, Ryan McDonald de, de l'Université de Michigan. Euh, Ryan a fait son doctorat en 2019 à l'Université Cambridge. Euh, ensuite, il est allé à l'Université Cornell. Il est maintenant, il détient la prestigieuse bourse euh, Sagan, qui est située sur l'étude des autres planètes. Et Ryan, c'est aussi l'un de nos collaborateurs dans l'équipe Twee, euh, associé avec le, 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 le temps garanti de Jim Club. Donc, c'est un expert de, de l'extraction spectrale de, de, de l'atmosphère de cette planète. Et c'est ce dont il va nous parler euh, aujourd'hui. Tous les défis à Sophie avec euh, Jim Swan. Ryan? Thank you. Merci. Bonjour. Hello. Happy to uh, to be here. And what what a time really to be here when essentially every single thing that we thought we knew about exoplanets is being fundamentally rewritten as we speak. And it it's great now that now that we're kind of solidly one year into the era of JWST, we actually have results that we can show you to really illustrate that this telescope is delivering on its promises and going above and beyond anything that we thought was possible. So um, essentially, in, in this talk, I'll be talking about the process that we used to essentially take an observed spectrum and then extract from that spectrum inferred atmospheric properties of what these planets are actually like, which for historical reasons are called atmospheric retrieval. And then I'll show towards the end some of the initial results that we've been getting from JWST and a couple upcoming ones that will be coming out very soon. So, okay. So um, in exoplanet science, there are a number of fascinating and very deep and profound questions that we're ultimately trying to address. Ultimately, ever since we first started discovering planets around other stars, immediately our classical perceptions of what planets actually are have been rewritten with discoveries of hot giant planets orbiting seven times closer than Mercury, so-called hot Jupiters. We, from the very first discoveries, have been finding out that our solar system is by no means the typical and only way that planetary systems can actually form. So we want to understand not only how common different types of planets are, but what is the chemical composition of their atmospheres? What are the physical, dynamical, and chemical processes at play in these um, very exotic worlds that have atmospheric chemistry regimes unlike anything that we have in our own solar system? And ultimately, and this is really where JWST is really coming into its prime. As we've been transitioning from the Hubble Space Telescope now into JWST, finally, the question of rocky planets around other stars, what their atmospheres are made of, and perhaps even could some of these planets have life on them, is finally entering the realm of science. So I really like this animation that Hugh Osborne put together that summarizes in the space of mass and orbital period, all of the planets that we have ever discovered that we know. So you'll see a couple of discoveries like, like um, oh look, there's Pluto, it'll go in a moment, so don't worry. Uh, but you'll see the exoplanets kick in really in the 90s where the exoplanet revolution begins. Initially with many of these hot Jupiters discovered by uh, the Doppler shift, the radial velocity method, but transiting planets, which I'll be talking about a lot in this talk, shown by the yellow circles here, really have kicked off and been most of the discoveries that we have found since. Here is where we are today in terms of the exoplanet population. Um, as of this morning, 5,347 planets have been discovered. On the left, what I'm showing is all of the planets that we have found for which we have a measurement or inference of the mass of these planets as a function of um, their orbital distance or semi major axis. And on the right, planets that principally were discovered via the transit method, for which we have a measurement of their radius. And although these diagrams have detection biases baked into them, like it's not intrinsically true that planets like the Earth and Venus are rare in our galaxy, it just requires much more observational time and resources in order to be able to detect planets like these. But already just by eye, you can see clustering taking place in this diagram, which illustrates a number of different populations of different types of planets. So the first exoplanets discovered that these hot Jupiters shown in the top left of the diagram there um, are planets with around about the radius and mass of Jupiter, but typically with temperatures of 1000 degrees going up, in some cases up to 3000 or 4000 Kelvin. A particularly exciting discovery has been that the most common type of planet in our own galaxy has a radius that 
spans between that of Earth and Neptune. So depending on how you ask, who you ask, these are sometimes called super Earths or mini Neptunes. And ultimately one of the core science goals that we have in the first few years with GWST is to detect atmospheres of these planets and try to understand what the most common outcome of planet formation actually is. Like, Are these uh, kind of larger versions of the Earth or um, you know, predominantly more like um, mini gas giants, if you will, that are not possible locations where we might expect to find habitable conditions? We don't know yet, but this is one of the core critical questions that we're trying to address. And then at lower radii, we have terrestrial planets. Um, this is the term that I'll be using for planets around about the size of Earth or slightly smaller throughout the remainder of this talk. And cool giant planets, just like the outer gas giants in our own solar system. So, everything on this plot, I've removed the error bars from these points because for many of these planets, we have huge uncertainties on their masses and radii. So, on the next diagram, this is just and radius to within about 30% precision. And there are a number of fascinating things that you can see here. So firstly, down here, um, I should say overplotted here, the curves are theoretical interior composition models for these planets. So you can see that consistent with a radius and mass dominated by hydrogen and helium, is the hot Jupiter population on here. And here is Earth and Venus, consistent with um, about 85% um, rock with an iron core. But we see already some exoplanets like the Trappist 1 system down here that are consistent with an co interior composition very similar to that of the Earth and Venus. And it looks like a transition takes place at around about 10 times the mass of the Earth where planets consistent with being dominated by rocks and magnesium silicates transition to become increasingly dominated by volatiles like water and eventually hydrogen and helium, which could be indicating observational evidence of the core accretion paradigm of planet formation, that once you have more than about 10 Earth's masses collected in a rocky core, then runaway accretion takes place of hydrogen and helium to produce gas giants. But ultimately, if we want to know what these planets are really like, we have to go beyond just masses and radii and examine the atmosphere. The Venus are very similar on this diagram, but completely different worlds in terms of the chemistry of the atmosphere, habitability. You couldn't imagine worlds that are more dissimilar. The techniques that we have available to us to characterize exoplanet atmospheres. Um, throughout the majority of this talk, I'll be focused on the transit method, which essentially relies on the fact that when a planet passes in front of a star, if we observe the four different wavelengths, at a wavelength where a more methane absorbs more strongly, the effective size of the annulus of the atmosphere increases. So by measuring how this effective size changes with wavelength, we can and then comparing that to uh, laboratory measurements or um, quantum chemistry calculations that predict the wavelength where different molecules absorb, we can then back out from this, even though we haven't spatially resolved the planet itself, what the atmosphere of this planet is made of. So in this uh, cartoon schematic that I put together, it shows the typical information content of a transmission spectrum that we saw routinely with the Hubble Space Telescope before GWST launched. So what this is illustrating is that in the visible wavelength range, we're principally sensitive to the physics of scattering at the shortest most wavelengths. So if you have small particles uh, like um, hazers that you would see in smog on the Earth, these can efficiently scatter short wavelengths of light causing the effective size of the planet to increase at the shortest most wavelengths. The visible wavelength range also encode information on electronic transitions, in particular for the alkali metals, sodium and potassium, that are routinely observed in the gas phase of these hot giant exoplanets with a thousand Kelvin or higher temperatures. But we really need to push into the infrared in order to be able to observe signatures of light molecules like water, carbon dioxide or methane. So here's the schematic and here's the real observations from this 
landmark paper by David Sink. Um, it's getting increasingly old now as I think about it. So um, what this is showing for a collection of 10 hot Jupiters, signatures of water vapor seen with different amplitudes, which is showing visually that clouds and aerosols appear to be quite common in exoplanet atmospheres. If you have a, a thick cloud deck in these atmospheres, it essentially cuts off the base of these water features, producing much more muted absorption. You can also see for a handful of planets, these sodium and potassium features, but pre-JWST, this was essentially what we saw for most transmission spectra of exoplanet atmospheres. Um, dozens of planets with signatures of water vapor and a handful of other chemical species. So before JWST, we've really been in the regime of the Hubble Space Telescope and um, ground-based telescopes that have principally been probing planets um, mainly hot Jupiters, but also planets with around about the mass or radius of Neptune. So on this diagram here with green pluses, I'm showing every exoplanet as a function of its temperature or radius for which we have detected an atmosphere to date. So what you can see here in the top right of the diagram is the hot Jupiter population, where most of our detections have been made to date. But there have been a handful of points that push down now into this fascinating intermediate regime between Neptune and the Earth. And even for two planets with temperatures that are around about that of the Earth. So we have already got signatures of water vapor for planets in the habitable zone, but um, perhaps not planets that have a rocky surface and would be hospitable. So by my count, we are currently at 83 exoplanets for which we have atmospheres detected. And, um, but this is rapidly changing on almost a weekly basis with all the discoveries that are now coming down from JWST. Okay, so how do we actually measure these properties and go beyond just detecting that a certain molecule is in an atmosphere to inferring quantitative constraints on how hot a planet is, its cloud properties, its chemical composition? So I'll illustrate this uh, kind of with a fun little diagram. So let's imagine that we're observing a hot Jupiter that is transiting in front of its star. There are kind of two different approaches that we usually follow when modeling these systems to be able to predict or infer what these planets are made of. So the first approach is essentially the fundamental physics and chemistry um, based approach. You encode as a system of equations that you then code up all of our a priori understanding of what should actually be going on inside these atmospheres. So this can range in complexity from like an analytic model that you could almost derive on pen and paper to three-dimensional global climate models that solve the equations of fluid mechanics or even magnetohydrodynamics to produce a predicted spectrum of the planet. So the effective size of the planet's atmosphere is a function of wavelength. And ultimately, this is the modeling approach that we take when we are actually proposing for time on Hubble or JWST. And if the universe was actually um, favorable to us, we might even find that our forward models actually match with our observations. But in reality, we normally see things that are quite different when we actually get the observations from our initial expectations. And this is where the second approach, which is ultimately the focus of my own research comes in, which is the so-called inverse approach or atmospheric retrieval. Essentially, what goes on inside an atmospheric retrieval code is you can imagine it almost like a, a giant for loop that iterates through hundreds of thousands to millions of possible atmospheric scenarios for a planet, compares each one to the observations, and then uses how discrepant that model is from the observations to inform the next location in the parameter space that it explores. So this is usually done via a Markov chain Monte Carlo or a nested sampling technique. And then via the framework of Bayesian statistics, it then gives us quantitative measurements on the parameters of the model, like how much water there is in the atmosphere, uh, how high clouds are, for example. And then we're happy and then we go off and publish the results. But um, unfortunately, this, this step often has a bit of a reputation as being some kind of magic that just goes on. You put in a spectrum into a black box and then out it tells you, the atmosphere has 10 to the minus three water. 
So what I want to illustrate is that it's not actually magic. It's actually kind of conceptually simple to visualize what is actually going on here. So to illustrate the problem that retrievals are trying to solve, here is a set of observations from 10 years ago now of a, um, a planet that actually just a couple weeks ago had a first GWST set of observations come down, the Supra GJ1214b. What this is illustrating is that the two gray models here are cloud-free models of this atmosphere, while the red and orange models include a thick cloud deck. So just by eye, you can see that the observations are they're pretty flat in the visible wavelengths and hence are not consistent with a cloud-free atmosphere. But if you're only able to calculate these four models, it then doesn't tell you that these two solutions here are the only possible explanations for the exoplanet spectrum. And it's this degeneracy problem where we want to map out the full range of possible atmospheres that can explain an exoplanet spectrum that is what we're trying to actually solve with an atmospheric retrieval. So this kind of cartoon I put together will illustrate the problem. Like imagine, for example, you have this set of observations shown in green of an exoplanet's atmosphere, which shows two water absorption features in the near infrared. And this toy model could be described by how hot the planet is and the abundance of water in the atmosphere. If instead you perturb the model, you increase the temperature of the planet that then increases the effective size of the atmosphere and hence amplifies all of the absorption features, you then don't have a model that provides a particularly good fit to the model. Uh, the reduced chi-squared is bad and um, the likelihood function that you would evaluate will show that this is not a particularly favorable fit. Similarly, if you increase how much water is in the atmosphere, it strengthens the water bands, and that location in the parameter space is also not an acceptable fit. So essentially, all a retrieval code is doing is scattering points throughout a parameter space to work out the range of parameters and any degeneracies between them that are consistent with the set of observations. In reality, we normally wouldn't have a two-dimensional space. This would be like a 30-dimensional parameter space, and hence we need um, quite sophisticated statistical algorithms to be able to map out this parameter space in a reasonable amount of time. But once you have um, this, what we call the, uh, the joint posterior distribution, you can essentially integrate over every parameter bar one, which we call marginalization, to produce a probability distribution for each of the parameters in your model, where the width of the distribution automatically encapsulates all of the uncertainty and degeneracies between all of the parameters in your model. And this is what we end up quoting in papers. So for our measurements of what properties of these atmospheres are actually like. So here is a schematic showing um, ultimately, in this case for the retrieval code that I developed during my PhD, Poseidon, kind of the flow chart of what ultimately happens when we run one of these retrievals. There's a lot going on here, but essentially, it falls down into two distinct modules. One is you need a function that you pass into it a set of numbers, like a, a vector of the properties of the atmosphere. So how hot the planet is, the abundances of all the molecules, cloud properties, stellar properties, and then it computes forward to a predicted spectrum corresponding to those that parameter vector. You then feed that through an instrument simulator, compare that particular model to a set of observations, and then based on how discrepant that is from the observations, a statistical sampling algorithm then informs the next choice of parameters to explore the space. And the output is then a giant triangle plot that's normally very hard to read with 30 parameters and detection significances for all the various components in the atmosphere. So I just want to briefly touch upon some highlights of some incredible results we had even before JWST launched from retrievals. And then we'll get on to looking at how JWST is rewriting all of this. So the first thing is that I mentioned earlier that the most common molecule that we have detected is water absorption, which we found in dozens of exoplanet atmospheres with the Hubble Space Telescope. But even just with the Hubble Space Telescope, we have seen tentative signatures of other chemical species in exoplanet atmospheres. Like in the top left here, these are observations with a hint of hydrogen cyanide at 1.5 microns, 
which is an interesting molecule because it's a sensitive probe of disequilibrium chemistry in the atmosphere. So um, if you have high energy ultraviolet photons striking the upper atmosphere that can dissociate uh, methane and cause a cascade of chemical reactions that can produce hydrogen cyanide, for example. There have also potentially been some signatures of ionic species in exotype atmospheres, like this continuum feature shown here in ultraviolet observations from Hubble is potentially a signature of the hydrogen anion H minus. So we could already be seeing before JWST early evidence of the importance of ionic chemistry in the upper atmospheres of exoplanets. And the reason that I highlight these is that whenever you see a chemical species that perhaps you didn't expect to see from your initial modeling, that can tell us something profound about the atmospheric dynamics and chemical processes that are at play in these atmospheres and help us refine the physics that we need to include inside of our models. We've also already been able to see some tentative signs that these planets aren't just spatially uniform spherical object with the same properties everywhere, which is perhaps not surprising if you ever look out when it's like a cloudy day, like planets vary all across their surface. But what's been remarkable is that even with Hubble observations, we've been able to find for a selection of exoplanets. What's shown on the y-axis here is if you fit for the fraction of the exoplanet atmosphere that is covered with clouds, it appears for a handful of planets that they really don't favor either being completely clear or completely cloudy. For a handful of planets, they appear to be about 50% cloudy, which is actually a prediction from three-dimensional climate models of these atmospheres. So it's encouraging to see already observational evidence of this. So this is essentially what we might be seeing, a planet where there's a spatially located cloud deck in a certain region of the planetary atmosphere. And although I've been focusing a lot on Hubble observations and observations from space, I do want to give a shout out for the incredible importance in recent years of high resolution ground based observations that have been producing um, spectacular insights into the atmosphere of these planets. So even if you have a, a non transiting planet, as the planet orbits around its star, um, thermal emission from the planetary atmosphere will have a Doppler shift due to the high velocity of the planet around its star. And these signals will be imprinted and buried in the total amount of light that we see from the star and the planet. So if you have a high resolution spectrograph with a resolution greater than about 30,000 or so, then by cross-correlating template models of the planetary atmosphere, sliding them back and forth until you hit the exact velocity of the planet, you can then sum up all of the lines of the all the individual absorption or emission lines from the planetary atmosphere that on their own would not be detectable in order to detect the presence of the atmosphere and place constraints on the pressure temperature profile elemental abundances and even isotope ratios so ground-based telescopes are also producing very complementary constraints on these atmospheres going hand in hand with space-based observations and JWST observations actually, is that it turns out that the star can also often complicate our inferences. So we of course know from our own sun that the sun is not uniform. There are, it's covered in star spots and also hot active regions called faculae. And when a planet transits in front of its star, if the region of the star that the planet transits in front has a different kind of average stellar surface feature than kind of the average of the whole stellar disk. This can imprint a wavelength dependent signature into our spectrum that we could end up mistaking for a detection of the planetary atmosphere. So what we're seeing here in this set of observations is a downward slope towards shorter wavelengths that's actually caused by unaccorded hot active regions on the surface of this star WASP-79, and a, a negative slope to lower wavelengths is something that we, we can't really explain by the planetary atmosphere. Any molecule that you would add to the model would produce a positive absorption feature. So this downward slope is a characteristic signature that 
the star is contaminating the observations. But even though I use the word contamination, which kind of sounds a bit negative, this is an opportunity. If you jointly fit for the presence of these unaccorded active regions on the star and the planetary atmosphere, you can actually measure properties of star spots and faculae. Like here, for example, you can place a measurement of the fraction of the stellar surface that is covered by these unaccorded active regions. So this is a positive thing, I think, in that we'll be able to characterize the stars and planets at the same time. It's extra information contained in our spectra. And if you're interested in this, I can highly recommend this um, uh, study analysis group 21 report that we put out um, last year that goes into great depth in all the uncertainties and things we don't know about star spots and faculae and how we can improve the modeling of these to understand the exoplanets better. See how GWST has been rewriting everything. Almost, almost a year ago now, um, this first transmission spectrum of an exoplanet was announced, in this case from the hot Jupiter WASP 96b which was chosen because we already had existing observations from the Very Large Telescope and the Hubble Space Telescope showing strong water absorption features, which were confirmed by GWST by a, a nearest here. But also we were finally able to extend the coverage of this spectrum to longer wavelengths that we haven't been able to access um, with any kind of spectral resolution pre-GWST. This was very much a teaser, this first spectrum, but perhaps the first real big discovery came out just a few months later, and I know many of us like around the room also worked very hard on this result, which was the first detection of carbon dioxide in an exoplanet atmosphere uh, with a ridiculous detection significance of about 30 sigma. So we had tentative evidence of carbon dioxide from Spitzer observations before, but Spitzer just gave us like two data points, one here and one here. So GWST has completely redefined what is actually possible. So following on from these observations, we actually observed via the early release science program for transiting exoplanets, this planet four times with four different instruments to validate and demonstrate the performance of GWST. And what's particularly encouraging is that in the wavelength regions where these four instruments overlap, we see completely consistent results. Including a surprise, one thing that we did not expect to see, and we actually didn't fit for in our first study, is this little bump here at about four microns. That after additional modeling, we concluded could only be explained by sulfur dioxide. And we confirmed this with both the NERSPEC instrument um, with two different modes. And what's exciting about this is that Sulfur dioxide shouldn't be present in the atmosphere of this planet if the atmosphere is in what's called thermochemical equilibrium. So you just take a parcel of gas at a given temperature and pressure and then wait for all the chemical reactions to reach a steady state. This requires a disequilibrium effect. In this case, an injection of energy from um, ultraviolet radiation. So this is a signature of photochemical reactions in the upper atmosphere of this exoplanet. So not only is this the first detection of a sulfur-bearing molecule in an exoplanet atmosphere, but it's also the first direct evidence that photochemistry is an important process at play in these planetary atmospheres. So this is already showing just a preview of how everything we thought we knew about giant planets pre-JWST is fundamentally being rewritten, and we're now able to do actual planetary science, really, for the first time for exoplanets. But we are starting to get our first observations of terrestrial exoplanets with GWST as well. So this spectrum is less exciting, perhaps, than WASP-39, because it is a flat spectrum, so this is a non-detection of an atmosphere. But these observations are sufficiently precise that we can now start to differentiate between different classes of atmospheric model for rocky planets. So before GWST, we could tell whether a rocky planet had a hydrogen atmosphere or not. We could rule out hydrogen-rich atmospheres. But in this case, we were able to rule out a methane-dominated atmosphere for this planet. But other scenarios like a water-rich atmosphere or a carbon dioxide-rich atmosphere are still consistent with these observations. And we're planning to follow this up with a 
third transit observation. Um, there are two shown here stacked together. They'll be coming down late this year. And this is a pretty cutting edge result from just a couple of weeks ago uh, that I was involved with, which is a detection of a non-flat spectrum for a rocky planet atmosphere using JWST. So what we see in these NERSTEC observations is a clear slope towards shorter wavelengths that is uh, preferred over a flat line to around three sigma significance. But there's actually two different explanations that are provide statistically identical fits. One would be that this could be the first time we've ever seen a 100% water steam atmosphere um, on a planet that is around about the temperature of the surface of Venus, so about 700 Kelvin. But alternatively, there could be no atmosphere on the planet at all, and it's just star spawns mimicking these signals, which would produce the orange model shown here. And the reason these models look so similar is that the end, the end star host here is sufficiently cool, it's about 3000 Kelvin, that water vapor can exist inside the star spots. So we're seeing water absorption in any case, but it's either coming from the star or it's coming from the planetary atmosphere. And the only way to really differentiate between these scenarios would be to get shorter wavelength observations. So that was kind of just a highlight of existing published results that have come out so far from GWST. And there is a whole mountain of new results that will be coming out very shortly. Uh, before showing a couple of those results, I just want to show how those of us that work on modeling of exoplanet atmospheres are having to kind of go back to the drawing board in many respects to deal with this much more precise data that we're getting from GWST. So I'm going to focus on two particular avenues that we need to examine carefully. One is the assumption that these atmospheres are spatially homogeneous for simplicity. We normally assume that the properties are the same everywhere. And the second assumption that we have been able to use fine for giant planet atmospheres is the assumption that we know the background gas of the atmosphere in advance. So, okay, three-dimensional models. So this is um, the output from a general circulation model of an ultra-hot Jupiter, hat P7b. And what I'm showing here is the temperature field to show that there is a substantial temperature gradient between the permanent day side and permanent night side of tidy locked planets like hat P7b. And when we're observing a transmission spectrum, rays are coming in through the day side and then going out to the night side. So the rays are experiencing a huge temperature gradient along the path. So perhaps it's not surprising that there should be some information contained in these observations about the inhomogeneities in the temperature and the chemistry throughout these atmospheres. But for simplicity, normally we just assume that that's all that we have, just a spherical atmosphere. The temperature is the same everywhere. Maybe the temperature varies with altitude but there's no difference in the conditions on the day side and the night side. So I've been um, working a lot in the last few years to assess how bad this assumption can actually be, the biases that could come from it, and also now with the quality of GWST observations, whether we can actually measure and extract from a spectrum directly these multidimensional properties. So the first thing that I've been working on is just how do we make it so that we can compute models of exoplanet atmospheres fast enough that we can even try and fit a 2D or 3D model? Because if you want to fit a million or 10 million models to a data set to map out the parameter space, if it takes a couple of minutes for every model, you'll be waiting a very long time before we actually have any results. So I've been developing linear algebra-based techniques to be able to rapidly compute three-dimensional models of exoplanet atmospheres they take about a second or less to compute. Essentially, the way this is set up is a cylindrical coordinate system where rays go through the atmosphere, and then you trace the ray as it goes through, calculating through the subdivisions of the atmosphere, the amount of absorption in a particular parcel of gas. So we have models now that are fast enough, in principle, to be able to fit for 2D or 3D effects. Another important problem though is how you parameterize this because if you imagine for example fitting for the temperature 
at every longitude and latitude on a planet, very quickly you could have 60 or 100 parameters you're fitting for, and then it will never converge. So I've been developing kind of the simplest prescriptions that we can come up with described by four or five numbers that can still produce temperature distributions that resemble those that you see when you take a slice through three-dimensional climate models. And here is illustrating, for example, in three dimensions, a four, a simple four parameter model that can nevertheless capture this day side to night side temperature difference and also asymmetries between each side of the planet. And you can also include into this spatially localized clouds that only cover a certain fraction of the atmosphere and also start at a certain kind of angle between the day side and the night side. So what we have found is that if you compare a one-dimensional model to a 2D or 3D model, there actually are some qualitative differences that you can't really explain with a one-dimensional model. In particular, the relative amplitudes of absorption features for molecules like water, if there is a strong gradient in the water abundance between the day side and the night side, these relative peaks change for a two-dimensional model in a way that you can't reproduce with a one-dimensional model. So this is a signature that we can look for in order to be able to tell that we actually need to have a 2D or 3D model. Similarly, if you have differences in the chemical composition between the like, east side of the planet and the west side, instead of changing the relative amplitudes of these features, it kind of broadens out the band. It changes the peak to wind shape of these features. So this is all just to illustrate that there are observational signatures in principle that we can use to tell that a 1D model is not sufficient. So that's the theory. And now here is the practice. So I've been working within the early release science program team for GWST to actually test a series of two-dimensional and eventually three-dimensional models against the initial observations that we have for was 39 b this is very much still a work in progress. The data is still evolving and there's a lot going on. But what I'm illustrating here is a model fit from a two-dimensional model to the um, NERSPEC G395 observations, which we're seeing provides at about the three sigma level a better fit than the one-dimensional models that we've been exploring so far, which is potentially indicating a difference in the chemical composition between one side of the planet and the other side. But yeah, don't take this away yet. Like this is still very much in prep and there's a lot still going on to test the robustness of this. And um, in addition to the chemical composition gradient, this corresponds to the same spectrum we were seeing on the previous slide. We're also seeing that it is possible to measure the angle from the North Pole where the cloud deck in this planet actually starts. So this is an exciting demonstration of the ability to extract spatial information on not just the fraction of a planet covered by clouds, but where in the atmosphere the cloud actually is. And this is a preview of a, a data set that um, we're very excited to be getting through the uh, NEAT program this October that um, I'll be working on with many of you here. So these are simulated observations for an ultra hot Jupiter WASP-121b which we theoretically expect there to be a strong gradient in the chemical composition between the day side and the night side. Um, the water molecule in particular should be dissociated on the day side, but present in molecular form on the night side. And so what we are expecting to see with these observations when they come down in October is that we should be able to directly extract from the spectrum different temperature profiles for the day side and the night side. We should be able to measure empirically that there is a temperature gradient, so it's not consistent with just a uniform temperature everywhere in the atmosphere. And even that we should be able to measure how much the water abundance changes along the line of sight as a ray goes through the atmosphere. So yeah, we're very excited to get these observations and analyze them. I can't wait to work with you all on these. So the second opportunity um, is now moving into these rocky planet atmospheres, 
because it turns out we have to relax actually a lot of assumptions to be able to explain these spectra. So with GWST, we can finally do this for the first time. And this is really setting a, it's essentially serving as a pathfinder for both the next generation of ground-based telescopes like the EELT and also the Habitable Worlds Observatory that will push down to Earth-sized planets around sun-like stars. So I just want to highlight a case study of the TRAPPIST-1 system to illustrate this, because we've been getting a lot of observations for all of the planets in this system coming down over the course of the past year. So pre-JWST, this was pretty much everything that we knew about the middle planet in the system, TRAPPIST-1e. So you can see from ground-based observations and Hubble observations here that the uncertainties were substantially larger than the differences between model predictions. So statistically, a carbon dioxide atmosphere, um, a water dominant atmosphere, everything was consistent with the observations, except for a hydrogen-rich atmosphere that was ruled out. But with GWST, if we get enough observations, in principle, this is the incredibly optimistic case of if you observe this planet for like five years of observations, just to illustrate the principle. What this is showing is that GWST does have sensitivity to detect molecules like water, carbon dioxide, even methane in these atmospheres. But molecules like ozone that would be fascinating to go after as being a possible signature of life will be incredibly difficult and probably not possible to see with GWST, because unfortunately um, the wavelengths where ozone absorbed happen to be at the shortest wavelength and longest wavelengths where GWST can observe where the instruments are much less sensitive. However, even if you, so that was a case for a hundred transits, even if you had 10 transits though, what I'm showing here via the orange contours is the ability to recover the input spectrum of an Earth-like atmosphere for TRAPPIST-1e, even with 10 observations. And you can see that water bands, carbon dioxide bands, methane bands are all, a, you can extract these from the observations, even when they're quite noisy with just 10 transits. So what we are expecting to see, or I should say hoping to see, when we get four observations of this planet next month, is potentially a detection of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, if the planet does have an atmosphere that resembles the Earth. However, we will need many, many, many more observations if we want to be able to actually differentiate between classical models, like be able to make methane abundance measurements. So this is just setting the scene that even though JWST can detect atmospheres for rocky planets around M stars, this is going to be a challenge, and we should expect that years of observations will have to be combined, stacked, and analyzed together in order to be able to go beyond just detecting an atmosphere to saying something about the actual atmospheric process that's going on and differentiating models. So it's possible, but it's a challenge, and we'll have to work for a while on this. So what I'm showing here is going back to the flat line of LHS 475b that I showed earlier. Because one challenge that we found in just trying to fit models this flat line is how we actually relax the assumption of knowing what the background gas is. Because when you're fitting a giant planet spectrum, just based on its bulk density, you know the atmosphere is dominated by hydrogen or helium, so you can make that assumption. But what we found here is that the constraints you get on the atmospheric properties are actually quite sensitive if you make that assumption. So if you assume that you know the atmosphere is dominated by molecular nitrogen, then what you get out of the retrieval process are these orange histograms here, which would then trick you into thinking that you have an upper limit on the carbon dioxide abundance, the methane abundance, and the water abundance in the atmosphere. But in reality, even if you did have an atmosphere that was completely dominated by carbon dioxide, since that's a much heavier molecule than hydrogen, it would just squash all the absorption features and you would still get a flat line. So if instead you use a 
fancy prior called the centered log ratio transformation, which is, is essentially just a mathematical function adopted from geology that accounts for the fact that any of the gases that you have could be the bulk gas, could be 100% of the atmosphere, and it treats all of the gases statistically identical. If you do that, then instead you see that the Rochure tells you, oh, actually, we don't know whether the atmosphere is carbon dioxide, water dominated, methane dominated, but we do know that it's not hydrogen dominated. That's a robust upper limit that is invariant to the priors that you use. So this is kind of our first takeaway message that we're starting to learn from fitting JWST observations of terrestrial atmospheres, that the assumptions of the prior distributions that we use can actually matter quite a bit. Second key takeaway that we've seen from GJ486B, that spot water degeneracy that I showed earlier, is that longer wavelength observations will always suffer for terrestrial planets around N stars from this degeneracy between water absorption coming from spots or coming from the atmosphere. We really need to have short wavelength observations in order to be able to differentiate between star spots and atmospheric signatures for rocky planets around N stars. And this is really a science case that NEARIS can just make phenomenal inroads on. So uh, this is really a big takeaway for any of your JWST proposals that NEARIS is key to be able to tell whether or not we have spots contaminating our spectrum. So for the final part of the talk, let's see some new things that are up and coming. So 34 giant planets. So in, I'll just illustrate this first. So this first result I'm going to talk about is from a different type of spectrum than what I've been focusing on for uh, the rest of the talk. So while we have been looking at transiting planets, like going through the atmosphere up to this point. You can also directly observe thermal emission from the atmosphere of a planet when it passes behind its host star. And so in a paper that's coming out probably about two weeks, through the early release science team, we have direct measurements of thermal emission coming from the atmosphere of the hot Jupiter WASP-18b. And this is actually resolved in time as the planet passes behind its star which actually enables you to make a low resolution temperature map, if you will, of the atmosphere, which is called eclipse mapping. So in addition to the eclipse map that's shown here in this nice um, animation, there is also an emission spectrum extracted from the planet. What this is showing is multiple water emission features coming from the planet and also some emission features that we're not entirely sure which molecule they're coming from. They could be H minus, titanium oxide, vanadium oxide, with a paper led by uh, Lou Philippe Cologne that should be coming out in nature in about two weeks or so. Um, we conducted a number of retrieval analyses and have been able to use these measurements to actually tell that the temperature profile of the atmosphere has an inversion. It increases with increasing altitude. So we've been able to measure a temperature inversion with emission features and also place a measurement on the metallicity of the atmosphere. In another paper led by um, Jake Taylor, this is showing a comparative retrieval study from four different codes of the hot Jupiter WASP-96b. So these are the observations from that were first announced from JWST way back in July of last year. And what we found is that when we make similar assumptions between different codes that were developed completely independently, we do actually get broadly consistent results for measurements of the atmospheric composition. In this case, measurements of the water abundance and carbon dioxide of this planet's atmosphere. And uh, keep an eye out because uh, there were recently approved cycle two observations that Michael Radical will be leading to extend this spectrum out to much longer wavelengths. So we'll be really excited to see if we can confirm that carbon dioxide feature at 4.5 microns. And uh, there's in this uh, paper that we will be getting submitted like very soon, it's led by uh, Mary Lou. We have been looking at um, one of the early release observations of um, the hot Jupiter HAT P18b. And what's particularly interesting about this spectrum is that we see clear signatures of both star spots producing this slope of short wavelengths 
and absorption features from the planetary atmosphere, which shows that we can simultaneously infer these properties at the same time and place both precise measurements of the chemical composition, like measure how much water there is to a factor of two or so, and measurements on the fraction of the star covered by spots and the temperature of these active regions. So this is illustrating that star spots need not be a limiting factor for our observations of giant planets. We can actually fit for both of them at the same time and hence produce insights for both the atmospheric planetary atmosphere community and for stellar astrophysics. Okay, so this is a cutting edge result that we're working on at the moment with the mirroring instrument on JWST for the hot Jupiter WASP 17b. So what we're seeing here is that if you fit for existing Hubble and Spitzer observations of this planet and then extend them out into the mid-infrared, we've confirmed a water absorption feature, but there's a bit of a discrepancy here at around 8.5 microns between our model predictions and what we're actually seeing with JWST. And based on our preliminary modeling, we think that this is actually um, an identification of an aerosol in an exoplanet atmosphere, in this case, SiO2, which has, so essentially we're seeing a resonance feature from this molecule that is a prediction of me scattering theory. So we, this is very preliminary, we have more work to do on this, but tentatively we think we might be seeing a chemical identification of what these clouds in hot Jupiters are actually made of. So keep your eye out for more on that. And the last two things I'll show, some terrestrial results. So in this great paper led by uh, Olivia Lim that we'll be submitting very, very soon, this illustrates for TRAPPIST-1b, time variability in the influence of the star on the spectrum. So in these two transits, for the first observation, we see a kind of upward slope with some waterband features that are essentially entirely described by unaccorded spots on the surface of the star itself. But then the second observation that we conducted had a completely different spectrum, where now we see this characteristic downward slope caused by unaccorded hot active regions, faculae, on the surface of the star. And this is showing that even though we can model simultaneously the influence of stellar active regions and the atmosphere, this is a challenge that we're going to increasingly have to deal with for rocky planets around M stars. If we want to be able to pull out these tiny atmospheric signatures, the star is really one of our biggest noise sources, if you will, although I wouldn't call it noise because it's like cool to actually be able to learn about what the star is actually doing. And there's a lot that we still don't know about M stars. So, and this last, very last slide I'll show, which is something I'm working on right now. So this is very cutting edge. So we recently observed a couple months ago, the rocky planet GJ 1132b, um, which is another planet that's around about the temperature of Venus. And what we are seeing in our first transit observation is a slope towards shorter wavelengths and potentially an absorption feature here at around 4.5 microns. Um, and we see that even with, even by eye in the full resolution data, I'm just showing the bin data here. So potentially this could be a signature from the atmosphere of a rocky planet. And so I've been working like very recently on trying to actually fit this and see if we can actually come up with an atmospheric explanation for this spectrum. Um, I deliberately haven't labeled specific molecules in here at the moment because I'm fully expecting it to change as the reductions change and evolve. Um, but we do have a candidate for what might be able to explain this little bump here and some of the features at shorter wavelengths. However, we then observed planet again with a second transit, and we now see a spectrum that doesn't have the same magnitude of a slope, and possibly that feature has vanished. So this is illustrating a really critical point for any claim of an atmosphere of a rocky planet with JWST that repeat observations with the same instrument mode are absolutely crucial to actually assess the reliability of any inference. So like we don't think we will end up claiming an atmosphere for this planet. But um, yeah, if you, if you really think you have an atmosphere, observe it multiple times just to make sure it is actually real. And uh, on that thought, I will leave up my conclusion. Happy to uh, take some questions. Thank you.
a better summary of what's going on with this event. Time. There's a lot going on. So, questions? I'm curious about the silver dust. Mm -hmm. why, why, wasn't, why wasn't that predicted? So, I guess really it's a question about how, how well is the photo chemistry understood? Can you work with silver dust? Yeah, so, so I think it wasn't predicted. So it wasn't predicted by like the out of the box models that we had gotten used to applying to every link, every different type of exoplanet. Um, the photochemical models already existed out there in the literature, and some studies had made predictions that we should see signatures of sulfur chemistry. But um, it took us a while to actually just understand. I mean, we, we went through a process of trying to fit 30 different molecules agnostically. To see what could explain that feature and then when we saw that sulfur dioxide was the only one then we then opened up all the photochemical models to actually see whether the model predictions produced like a realistic abundance for the molecule that compared with what we were fitting in the spectrum so it's it's more than it just it required slightly more sophisticated models than what we immediately had that we could just open up and put out of the box but um, there were people that had worked on it for a number of years and were like, I think I know what that is. Um, just following up, for somebody who's outside of the exoplanet, mm -hmm. we have, what does it mean to have that kind of volume compared to what we have in the solar system? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, ultimately a, a terrestrial analog of it would be ozone in our own atmosphere produced by um, ultraviolet photochemistry. So. We already know from our own solar system, both from Earth and almost every um, terrestrial planet that we have, that photochemistry is vital for modeling the upper atmosphere. So it's perhaps not a surprise that the same physics is going on in the upper atmospheres of exoplanets. Um, but what it shows is that the models that we had created for photochemistry do indeed generalize beyond the solar system and are making predictions that seem to be matching our first observations. So the, the broader significance of it is just showing that we can't always just make simplifying assumptions that the atmospheres of every exoplanet is in equilibrium. We need to consider the influence of the star in this case from the high energy photons in order to accurately understand the chemistry that's going on. Yeah, question from Sarah. For WASP 17B's bump at 8 micrometer, doesn't explaining it require re the resonance feature of a SIU2 from my theory or require mm -hmm. a very narrow aerosol size distribution? Yeah. You can repeat that if you will. Yeah, that's a great question. So, yeah, we're, we're still going through the process of, I mean, firstly, um, we're going through the process right now of trying to disprove this by trying to find any other aerosol that is not SIO2. That could explain it. We're pretty sure this is a signature from me scattering. And at the moment, the only thing Canada we have is SIO2. Um, we're working at the moment on building the retrieval capabilities to actually fit for things like the width of the particle size distribution to see if we can. I mean, we'll be able to place a constraint on the mean size of the particle distribution and the chemical species, but we're not sure yet whether we'll actually be able to directly constrain, given that this is quite low resolution, the data here, the um, width of the distribution itself. Yeah, coming to that, so in the ERS team, we had actually a bit of a hard time with, with MIRI. Mm -hmm. um, does that data set also show that same effect that everything along one of 10 micrometer is a bit, has, has different light curves or different the light curve? Yeah, I mean, it, it does look like there is that, that dip uh, above 10 microns that we've also seen with ERS. So we, we are still, we are still inferring the SIO2, even if we just cut all the data that is above 10 microns. But uh, yeah, I would question much more the data at those longer wavelengths for the same reason that we've seen in the ERS team. Yeah, so you see the same effect that the, the settling time photometry and spectrophotometry takes longer. Yeah. yeah. And, and, uh, when, when you get into the uh, day to night side and, and, and like the court going so through transit, do you mm -hmm. include the effects like when you're at the beginning or the middle or the end of your transit, you're not probing, you, you vary your angle. So mm -hmm. no one ever talks about the in transit result within the transit. So mm -hmm. there, I guess, yeah. Do you so, do that? At the moment, I am not, but I am like in collaboration with people where we do have techniques that can 
kind of fit for the time dependence through the transit or through the ingress or through the egress. So there aren't techniques that have been recently developed to do this. But um, yeah, what, watch this space, I'll say. Like, it's still waiting to have applications to real university data, but it will happen, it will happen soon. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> they see that names are getting because you are also probing the chain of names. Yeah. Tell me one last question on EQ. Uh, so, uh, just by I, it, it, it seems to have some similarity with uh, GG486. So, could you potentially explain the spectrum with the look combination? Yeah, that's a good point. Um, I'm working on this, like, I mean, I have our two wells, like, running now. So, uh, yeah, we can mostly fit that slope of stellar contamination, but not the peak there. Um, so, I mean, it could be a mixture of an atmosphere and stellar contamination, which would be messy. Um, but, yeah, at this, at this time, I wouldn't, yeah, I, I wouldn't claim anything at this point, because, I mean, you can even see there's still residual differences between two of the data reductions. So there's kind of more work to do just on the data side here. But, I mean, I would not be surprised if that is the explanation, because we wouldn't expect atmospheric variability to produce such a huge change between two transits. But if it's just there are more spots for transit one and less for transit two, that's probably a more realistic explanation for what could explain the differences that we're seeing. Okay, uh, Ryan will be with us uh, today.